So apparently Bitcoin is garbage. Investors are fleeing, it's lost nearly two thirds of its value, and now a new survey says 60% of investors believe Bitcoin's more likely to hit $10,000 than it is to rally up to 30,000. That means that these investors expect Bitcoin to fall another 60%. In that survey, a quarter of investors describe cryptocurrencies as garbage. They're quitting crypto. The world has literally never been as negative about cryptocurrencies as it is now. But hold on a sec, because that might be exactly why now could be the best time ever to buy Bitcoin. And by the way, if you really want to be able to grab a hold of this market and get real-time insights, check out my membership group, Finova. It's like OnlyFans, except you're much more likely to get a return on investment. There we have daily trade signals, live coaching where you can ask any investment questions you might have, and a community of talented investors. You can try it out for free, linked in the description below. So, in the past, Bitcoin has followed a classic boom-bust pattern, following it aggressively. To get a sense of where Bitcoin sits in that cycle, let's take a look at the classic pattern of an asset bubble. As the bubble builds, enthusiasm turns to greed, which then turns into delusion. And then, it bursts. There's always a burst. Post-burst, you have denial then fear, and finally capitulation and despair. It's only after all of that pain that you see a return to price growth. Looking at Bitcoin's price, it looks very much like it's reaching the capitulation or even possibly despair phase, which could signify a coming return to growth. But we can't just look at one chart, make up our minds and be like, that's it. There's always more to the story. The first question that pops into my mind is, could this really happen that quickly? I mean, Bitcoin was at all time highs just eight months ago. Typically an asset slump lasts much longer than that. But maybe that's not the case anymore, especially not for Bitcoin, because it looks like market cycles are accelerating. Here's how they work. During times of growth, people and businesses borrow more money, which leads to more growth and rising markets. But over time, this credit expansion leads to inflation, which triggers a need for higher interest rates. This causes an economic slowdown and a decline in borrowing. Borrowing. Markets fall and inflation eases up, hopefully. Eventually interest rates settle down, which makes it easier to borrow again. And so the economy gets back to growth and on and on like that. It's always two steps forward, one step back when it comes to the economy. Over the past 50 years, these economic expansions have typically taken eight or nine years to play out. But now this timeline seems to be getting condensed. It was only about five years from the end of the dot-com crash to the beginning of the housing bubble crash. And now in 2022, we're witnessing the second stock market crash in just two years. And it's even more obvious when you look at longer time horizons. After the infamous 1929 stock market crash, it took 25 years for the Dow Jones to return where it peaked before the crash. But after the Great Recession of 2008, it took just six years. So why is this happening? And while no one can say for sure, there are a number of explanations that make a lot of sense. The most blatant is digital communications. Information has never moved faster. An investor can read an article on their phone at 9 a.m. and make a trade by 9.02. And not only are investors getting information faster, they're far better educated. They can make more informed decisions because they actually have access to good information unlike 50 years ago or 70 years ago. And the psychology of investing has completely changed as well. You've probably heard the term BTFD, by the <laughs> dip. That wasn't always conventional wisdom among investors. The average Joe investors who got wiped out in the 1929 crash, they weren't thinking, oh, you know, if I dollar cost average through this beast of a Great Depression, through a long enough time horizon, I'll probably be all right. They weren't thinking that. If they had, the market might have recovered a lot faster. But instead, an entire generation of would-be investors got scared off from the markets forever. Another explanation for these roided up market cycles is that central banks are enabling it big time. Beginning with the dot-com bust around 2000, central banks like the US Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan have increasingly stepped in to rescue markets in a downturn. They do this first by lowering interest rates to rock bottom levels. And since the Great Recession of 2008, they've also been playing this kind of grand experiment, thanks to Ben Bernanke, called quantitative easing. It sounds way more complicated than it really is. Essentially, all this means is printing money in order to buy up bonds and assets. 
Doing this increases the supply of money. Now, when you buy a bond, the money supply doesn't change at all because you're using money that's already in the system. But if the Fed does it, it's just making money out of thin air. So anything they buy just adds to the total pool of money. And when there's more money floating around, people spend more and the economy accelerates. This process is a huge help during market crashes. It's like, mm. but there's no such thing as a free dollar. And of course, this all has some unintended consequences. Some say it leads to rising inequality. When there's more money, each individual dollar is worth less. And people with assets like stocks or real estate, they're impacted, but not as badly because those asset prices will eventually adjust to the new value of the dollar. However, people making an hourly wage will simply see their buying power go down. That's a much, much harder position to be in. And this QE phenomenon has done something really weird to markets. Eventually over time, investors realized that the value of their investments is dependent not only on market fundamentals, but on central bank tricks as well. According to Bloomberg, this is the reason why markets crashed so fast in the first half of 2022. When inflation soared and the Fed started fighting that inflation by raising interest rates and reducing debt purchases, investors realized that they couldn't count on the Fed's magic tricks anymore because they had none left. All their cards were already on the table and confidence in the market evaporated overnight. But this still leaves a question. How do we know when the market is about to turn down or even better, start on the road to recovery after a crash? Well, I have a story that might just help. Joe Kennedy, the father of President John F. Kennedy, shorted the market ahead of the 1929 crash and made a fortune. But even more interesting is why he did it. He had a conversation with a shoeshine boy. And you might be wondering, like, this shoeshine boy told him to short the market and he made a fortune? No, actually the opposite. The shoeshiner knew all of the latest market news and eagerly tracked his investments. He made it seem like the markets were some kind of casino where everyone comes out a winner, total euphoria. That set off the warning alert for Joe Kennedy. In Joe's view, when even the shoeshine boys have jumped into the market, it means the stock market mania is reaching a fever pitch. The market is overbought, it's time to sell. So he acted on that intuition, short of the market and made a boatload of cash. So did we have a shoeshine boy moment before this market downturn? I think so. I think it was the entire meme stock, meme coin craze of 2021. Chances are, if you're watching this video, you're the investor of your family or friend group. You tend to hear about big finance news first, and you'll always make better investments because you get in early because you monitor this stuff on a daily basis. People probably message you to get your opinion on some investment that they're looking into. You're a great person to be, but when everyone you know starts asking about a particular stock or crypto, when brokerage accounts are being set up in record numbers, when marketing becomes more important than fundamentals in investing, that's when you should be the most concerned with the markets. So I propose a new measure telling us when markets are overpriced. The stonk indicator. When stocks become stonks, the party's probably about to end. It's 4 a.m., people are passed out, and you wish you just went to bed at 11 like you wanted to. Does this mean you should sell everything? No, not necessarily. You can still find a good deal in a bad market or a hot market, but this is a good time to reevaluate your positions and take profits if you have them. Maybe set a reminder on your phone to watch this video again in December 2023 when the market is hot again. And while you do that, let me tell you about a little app that I use called KuCoin. With KuCoin, you can buy and sell hundreds of cryptos. You can short stuff, you can do futures, we can, you can do pretty much anything you wanna do in crypto. But what I really enjoy is the lending. Theirs is market rates. So you don't have to worry about like liquidity issues on the platform. In the past year, I've made just over $25,000 lending on the KuCoin platform. A lot of that is from stable coins, but those rates are down right now with the bear market. But other rates are still strong like BNB at 14%. So if you wanna try it for yourself, there's a discount link in the description. Works pretty well. Okay, back to the question. If there's a shoeshine boy rule or a stonk indicator telling you when to get out of the market, is there the opposite rule telling you when to get back in? There is. And the simplest version is... Buy low, sell high, that's my motto. I may just quit my job at the power plant and become a full-time stock market guy. 
Or as Baron Rothschild said in the 18th century, the time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. That worked quite well for him because he made a fortune buying in the financial panic that followed the Battle of Waterloo. In his case, the blood in the streets was sort of literal, so maybe we want a more modern example here. Uh, let's look at Warren Buffett instead, who was probably alive during Waterloo, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. When markets crash, Buffett is known to get pretty busy buying up companies at a discount. But he doesn't just buy any old business because it's a cheap price. He looks for companies with a proven track record and competitive advantage, meaning market share, brand recognition, or control of a scarce resource. When he finds a business like that, he's ready to buy the dip. Now, Buffett is no fan of crypto, not even Bitcoin, arguing that it's an asset that never proved its usefulness. But if you are a fan of crypto, the Buffett strategy implies that you should be bullish on Bitcoin for the long term. In crypto, Bitcoin holds the market dominance that the Buffett strategy calls for. As the dominant player in the space, Bitcoin has the best shot at becoming a widely used currency. So in other words, the coin with the strongest fundamentals. But how do you know when there's enough blood in the streets that things are starting to get better? There's no guaranteed way to know exact dates. But one measure of how well or badly an asset is doing is the relative strength index. This measures an asset's market performance as compared to past performance. The Bitcoin RSI hit an all-time low this summer. It's the weakest it's ever been. And that might be a solid sign it's bottomed or near bottoming right now. Another good sign for Bitcoin is that in recent weeks, it's stabilized at a price level that's the same as the peak from its previous bubble in 2017. And one of the biggest talking points that Bitcoin fans use is that it's a hedge against inflation. So in other words, it will maintain its value even as the value of fiat currencies erodes away. That's because the total number of Bitcoin is capped at 21 million. Now that may or may not prove to be true in the long run, but one thing seems to be true. Bitcoin's value is not immune to inflation or other markets, at least in the short run. A report earlier this year found that more and more Bitcoin moves in the same direction as the stock market. If high inflation persists, the Fed and other central banks will keep hiking rates, spooking the markets. If this is the case, Bitcoin's recovery from this point is not guaranteed. But here's the thing, Bitcoin has decreased far more than the markets as a whole. It's down two thirds while the S&P is down 21%. At least compared to stocks, Bitcoin looks oversold. Remember, 60% of investors believe Bitcoin will keep falling. So the big question is, has all hope been lost? Because if so, there may already be enough blood in the streets.